uh, how I got into this research. My original research um, for many years was looking at how animals uh, gather information about resources and uh, outside of the context of contests, but also within contests, how they evaluate resources and how they might also evaluate uh, their opponents and using those makes uh, sound decisions about when to give up the contest. Um, my approach here was to look at the cognitive processes involved, or at least the cognitive abilities involved, and motivational change. And I was plodding along quite happily uh, in this line of research when one Friday night I went to my local pub restaurant for dinner uh, in, in a little town called Killyleigh in Northern Ireland. Delightful place, is, is the pub. Uh, nice little castle there. Uh, and I bumped into, or noticed also waiting for his dinner, um, was this chap, Rick Stein, uh, who's a very well-known uh, TV chef, uh, seafood chef. And so I stand pretty well next to me in the, in the restaurant size. I said to him, we, we have a mutual interest in crustacea. I said, I study their behavior, and you cook them. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, well, not, not being provocative on it. And he simply asked, do they feel pain? And I thought, that's a very silly question. But I was polite. Uh, and, and I discussed pain uh, with him uh, uh, for a short period. And then he went and had dinner, and I, I had dinner. But it sort of nagged at me. Uh, the question nagged at me, how could you investigate pain in something like crustacea? I mean, you can't ask them. And what, what approaches could you make? And then, by, by pure chance, uh, about a year after this event, I, was, I had time to spare in London. I was sitting just about 100 metres away from here at Lincoln in Fields, writing in, in my book uh, about possible approaches uh, that started the research. So it did start quite close to here. Uh, well, the problem with looking at pain in invertebrates is that there are two main components. Uh, they're thought to be two main components. One is nociception. And nociception gives the, an animal the ability to respond by reflex, uh, but it does not infer any feeling. So if you apply an noxious stimulus to an animal and you see it respond, that doesn't tell you anything really about pain. It might just be reflex. And indeed, all the literature seems to point and say that invertebrates respond by reflex. Whereas pain is an unpleasant feeling that's generated in the central nervous system in response to that nociceptive input. Um, nociception is, is very widespread, we know, but we don't know how widespread pain is. Well, if nociception enables the animal to respond by withdrawing either all all part of its body from the stimulus, it, 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 it avoids further tissue damage. So it's an effective mechanism, if you like, of, of escaping from that uh, noxious stimulus and damage. So what is the function of pain? What, what, why have that complex, uh, unpleasant feeling? And, and the reason is, uh, the, the only sensible explanation I've come across, it is that the aversiveness uh, generates a high negative motivation, and th th that's a long-lasting motivation. Uh, the animal may learn to quickly avoid such situations in the future, so it avoids getting into that same situation again in the future more easily. So it should, uh, pain should enhance fitness by reducing future tissue damage, and thus increasing fitness. There, there's been a range of suggestions, of criteria that you might expect to see fulfilled uh, should an organism experience pain. And I, I'm just going to go through uh, six here. Um, there, there are more. Um, people are very fond of splitting criteria to create more and more. And I've been involved in a paper. I think we've got up to, up to about, about 20. But uh, I think that's taking a bit too far. Um, so we'll start with avoidance learning. Um, pain, as I said, provides a strong negative motivation. 
and should enhance avoidance learning for long-term protection. Um, but the animal should also be capable of some discrimination learning because if it just avoided everything, it would miss positive opportunities. And the technique we use here were using uh, shore crabs. Shore crabs, if you've been on the shore and found crabs there, you, you, you will know that you have to turn over rocks or turn over seaweed. They hide in the dark during daylight hours um, to avoid predators. So we figured that if we uh, placed uh, a, a crab in a very lightly lit area and provided it with two dark shelters, these, these are our simulated rocks here with, with places to hide in under there, that they would go. And they do, they reliably go into one of these uh, shelters. Uh, we uh, arranged to uh, have our crabs wired up so that we could deliver small electric shocks uh, using this insulated copper wire with the insulation just scraped off here where it was wrapped around the hind legs of, of, of the crab. And uh, the crab, each crab was randomly selected to receive a shock or not in the first shelter that it went to. So it wasn't the shelter we were choosing to deliver shock. Whichever shelter the crab chose, we were either going to shock it or not, but we decided that before it chose the shelter. And the crab uh, was uh, shocked every five seconds if it remained in the shelter. Uh, if it got out of the shelter, um, we stopped the shock. And, and then we repeated these trials every two minutes we placed the crab back into the middle here and, and it could make a choice again. Well, we can look at the, the effects of being shocked or not in, in trial one on its behaviour in trial two. And by stick, I mean it went back to the same shelter it used in trial one uh, and, and switched, it, it switched to the alternative shelter. And you can see here that uh, Being shocked or not has no effect on their behavior in trial two. That's zero uh, effect. Um, but what you can see is there's a strong tendency for all the crabs to go back to their first choice of shelter in the second trial. So they seem to have some sort of immediate preference for shelters. So let's see what happens uh, after trial two. This is what happened uh, in trial three, how did their uh, experience in trial two uh, affect what they did in, in trial three? And what you can see here is that uh, those that were shocked were significantly more likely now to switch in trial three to the alternative shelter um, compared to those that were not shocked. So just, just two experiences in this situation has caused a change in their behavior to avoid the shock shelter. Uh, those points there are supposed to be joined up. This is uh, switching systems here, but uh, it seems to be reasonably effective. What we find is that if we look over the 10 trials that we used, uh, the use of the shock shelter uh, dropped off the use of the non-shock shelter increase. And this line are some few crabs that, that just, just didn't go into any shelter after the first, uh, after the first trial. Uh, so some didn't go in. As I said, some crabs uh, got out of the shelter uh, during a trial, but no crab ever showed, and uh, never got out of a shelter if it was a non-shock shelter. They only ever got out if there was a shock received. And uh, we can see here that even in early trials, about 50 to 60 percent uh, get out of the shelter uh, when they're shot. Um, but that increases quite dramatically up to 80 to 90 percent uh, in, in later trials. So it seems almost as if there, there, there might be some learning or possibly sensitization, but possibly learning uh, of another technique of avoiding shock or a lot of shock, is you get out quite rapidly. But it does tell us that the shock is, is aversive at least, and uh, it 
I'm taking this as being really suggesting it's non-reflexive. Uh, in, in that they, they, they show an increase in this behavior going through. But it's not, it may not be entirely reflexive. So uh, they show very swift discrimination learning. Uh, that's not pre predicted simply as a nociceptive reflex. And the data are consistent with the idea of pain. I, don't, I keep saying consistent with. It doesn't mean proved. It means it's consistent with the idea. So let's get on to motivational trade-offs, and what I mean by a motivational trade-off is that a reflex it is it will be the same irrespective of other motivational requirements. Um, it, it doesn't require any higher level processing. Um, but whereas behavioral decisions require trade-offs, typically involve trade-offs between differing motivational requirements for a pattern. Uh, and if we find that the response to a noxious stimulus is traded off against another requirement, uh, then it must be more than a reflex. It must involve the central nervous system. We used hermit crabs in this experiment. For years I pondered on how to use hermit crabs in these experiments. Uh, and, and I thought this was difficult because they live in shells that protect them very, very effectively. And it just dawned on me one day during during a conference, and, you know, I, I can drill holes in, in, in the shells and uh, put these little uh, wires through and, and deliver shots to the naked abdomen. These, these crabs have a naked abdomen which they hold within the shells. And uh, that's what they look like when they're wired up. And they can wander around, the wires are not fixed in any way, they can walk around, we can look at their behavior. Uh, and what we simply did in this experiment was to uh, deliver shocks of in increasing intensity up to about 20 volts in fact. And we looked at how many actually got out of the shell uh, during this treatment. Um, but there were three different treatments. In one group, uh, it was just they were just in seawater, and 95% of them got out of the shell uh, during this treatment. Others had the odor of mussels. Uh, the, the, these are um, non-predators, and uh, about 80% got out of their shell during the treatment. Others had the odor of a predator, shore crab, uh, and only 41% got out of the shell if, if there was the odor of a predator present. So th these are significantly different. Predator was significantly different from non-predator, and significantly different from seawater. So these animals are trading off their decision to escape from the shock with uh, a requirement to avoid uh, predation. So it seems that that, that that is in keeping with the idea of a motivational trade-off. In a second experiment, we used uh, crabs inhabiting two types of shell. Uh, one uh, litter right now, these crabs on our shores really like these litterina shells, and they really do not like these gibbiver shells. And um, in fact, here is a picture of a crab in a gibbiver shell about to attack this crab and try and get it out so it can take the litterina shell. Uh, they don't do it in reverse. They don't want these shells. So uh, we induced crabs to occupy either the good quality litterina or the poor quality gibular shells, uh, they were all wired up. And we delivered electric shocks. Now, these were small electric shocks, smaller than the previous experiment, because in fact, we didn't want the shock crabs to get out of the shell. We just wanted to deliver a small shock, and then we were going to offer them another shell to see whether the shock affected their behavior towards the shell. So some were shocked, some were not shocked. However, some of the shocked crabs did in fact get out of the shell. Uh, and you can see here that far fewer got out of the litterina shell than they did the gibular shell. That is, they had a, a, a poor quality shell. They were, they were happier, if you like, or not, not happier. They, 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 they were more willing to give up that shell uh, to escape uh, the shock. So this shows clearly that uh, there's a motivational trade-off rather than a simple reflex escape response. 
So the, the main object of the experiment was to offer these crabs, the shock ones and the non shock ones, uh, another shell. And uh, they were more likely, we found they were much more likely to approach that shell and more likely to move into that shell if they'd been shocked. And uh, how they did that was also informative, in that if we look at the time taken to approach the shell, those that were shocked approached much more quickly than those were not shocked, uh, irrespective of the species of shell that were being used. Uh, and when you uh, observe crabs assessing shells, they spend quite a lot of time investigating new shells. They dip their chilipeds or, or main claws within the aperture of the shell to make sure it's a, a, a decent shell. If they've been shot, they, they really cut this down to a minimum. They are much more eager to take this new shell if they've been shot previously. Now, in this experiment, the new shell was, off, was offered only about 30 seconds after the shock. But we did a repeated experiment in which shells were offered up to 24 hours later, and we found the same responses. So there is a long-term change in behavior towards shells. That the crab seems to be uh, has downgraded its regard for a shell if, if it had received a shock within that shell. And it remembers that for at least 24 hours. We often see in, uh, you know, from your own uh, experience, if you've done any DIY, uh, you've done it in a machine as I have, and uh, had cause to bang uh, your finger with a hammer or something, or glance a screwdriver up into the palm of your hand. Um, you, you uh, humans, a uh, whole range of animals, show um, prolonged uh, directed rubbing. You can use the rub, and, and uh, it's, it's, it's a commonly seen uh, behavior. So we uh, did an experiment uh, here uh, on glass prawns. Uh, glass prawns are so named because they're very difficult to see, you know, they're quite transparent. Um, but they are very handy for, for the, this sort of experiment. You know, they have very long antennae. So just to take you through the experiment here, uh, there were two stages to the experiment. We first selected at random one of the antennae. And we brush on that antenna either seawater, we, we have to take it out of the water to do this, we brushed on either seawater or a local anesthetic. We then put it back in the water for five minutes, then we took it out, and we uh, again treated some with water, some with sodium hydroxide, some with acetic acid, or we pinch the end of the antenna with forceps. And I'll just build up the data slowly. Uh, these are the, the group that were pre-treated with water. Uh, this is the group uh, that got water again in the second uh, treatment. They do not groom. Uh, grooming in, in, in this animal is they, they have small pincers and they repeatedly pull the pincers uh, across the, the antenna. And I'm not showing the data, the ultra showed another behavior called rubbing. They, they rub the antenna on the side of the tank. Uh, you don't see that at all with, with water as a second treatment. With the noxious chemicals, you see a lot of grooming and also a lot of rubbing. Uh, and uh, pinching caused very little change in, in, in their behavior, just a, just a slight amount. But the important thing to come out of this is, if you look at the other antenna, we record their behavior to both antennae, even though we only treated one. You see there's hardly any response to the alternative antenna. That is, these animals uh, can at least discriminate, or, or, or they have some awareness, or some way of directing their behavior at the site of treatment. We've seen that also in our hermit crab experiment, where we induced some to get out, uh, get out of their shell after shocking. Um, we'd spent years, I mean, about 
30 years of my life have been spent cracking crabs out of shells to use in experiments. And I've never seen one groom its antenna, uh, its, um, its abdomen. But crabs have been shot within the shell. When they get out, they turn and groom their abdomen. So that there's some sort of awareness of the site of stimulus, or at least activity is directed at that. If we look at the, uh, those that were treated with anaesthetic before, in the pre-treatment, we see that the, there's a significant reduction in the grooming and <coughs> rubbing uh, of, of, of the antennae. So, uh, I don't want to go too much into the anaesthetic, I don't think it tells us an awful lot. I think there's some sort of awareness here of the site of, uh, of the wound. It seems the most interesting thing for me is the one all the way on the right. The anesthetic on the untreated antenna, is that significant compared with... Um, no. Uh, there are quite large error bars there. Oh, okay. So, it was obviously uh, I know. I look at that and I think, it should be lower. But then now, getting away from some of my work, to I'll do some recent work by uh, a French group. Uh, something that you might expect, if, if an animal has experienced pain, uh, you might anticipate uh, that it, it would be anxious about any reoccurrence of pain, um, visiting the dentist effect. In these experiments on crayfish, uh, fossac, in two superb papers, uh, used a, a cross maze uh, to uh, look at the behavior. If you put a crayfish in the middle, they wander around, they wander in the dark areas of, of this cross maze, and they also wander around in the light areas. And, but they spend slightly more than 50% of the time in, in, in the dark areas. It's about 60 to 70% usually here and about 30%, 40% here. However, if before you put them in the maze, you put them in this apparatus, and you shock, repeatedly shock the, the, the crayfish, when you then put it into the maze, they stick very much to the dark areas. So here's a distribution with the unstressed, unshocked animals. Uh, there's, there's, averaging around about 40% of their time in the light. Um, those that have been shocked, not stressed here, uh, it's much skewed to the left. They, they spend far less time in the light area. Then light areas are, are potentially dangerous for crayfish, and, and they, they seem to be avoiding this danger. Uh, if if the, the, the shock is, is a short duration, it has hardly any effect but increasing duration of, of the shock has increasing effect um, are by, by increasing the time spent in the dark or decreasing the time spent in the light. This simply shows that they will recover time after the, the stress, they, they do recover. And here, we, we've got a figure here of, of serotonin levels in the brain. Uh, those that were shocked had higher serotonin levels than those that were not shot. Uh, looking at those data, the work of these Fossack co-workers uh, took crayfish, they didn't shock them at all, they simply injected them either with serotonin or with saline, and those that got the serotonin stuck to the light, stuck to the dark area, I should say, those that got the saline uh, they, they, they were just like unstressed animals. So serotonin injections makes them appear as if they're stressed. So the, the continuum of the animals who the crayfish receive the initial shock, does it matter whether that's light or dark? Or was it light or dark initially? Um, you've got me, I, I, don't, I don't know. I suspect it was in the light. But I, 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 I don't know. I don't know all that precise detail. Oh, that's important, of course, right? They would be just the worst of the condition to the light. It could be. Well, that's an important detail. Yeah. I will check. <laughs> In humans, anxiety is a, 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 a medical problem, 
And uh, humans may be prescribed as, I can't pronounce it, but I'll use the trade name Librium. Um, li Librium is given to reduce anxiety in humans. Uh, and uh, Fossat and his co workers uh, looked at the behavior of unstressed animals, that is, I showed before, stressed animals here. Those that were stressed, plus given Librium, are now behaving like unstressed animals. The Librium has the same effect on crayfish in reducing this behavior that has been suggested to show anxiety. That they, they are willing to take more risks after being stressed if, if they have this anti Librium. <coughs> what does the Librium act on? <sighs> it's a biogenic convenience very straightforward how it would work. I'm not sure that these elements would have functioned. I would just gobsmack that something that worked on humans would work on crayfish. <laughs> One problem we see in, in identifying physiological measures of, of, of stress um, it is, is if, if you offer a noxious stimulus to an animal, it often responds in a very vigorous way. And uh, a, a, one thing we often see in stressed animals that increases is lactate. Lactate shoots up. In, in crustaceans, they, they release this hyperglycemic hormone that acts rather like um, mammalian hormones, stress hormones, to release uh, or change glycogen to glucose uh, for, for immediate use. But one outcome of that is it increases lactate. Now, unfortunately, this, this hormone is quite tricky to, um, to assay. Lactate is very easy to assay. But of course, lactate could easily increase due to activity, vigorous activity. So we ran a, a, a very simple experiment. We took shore crabs, we shot some, didn't shock others, and when we looked at their activity levels overall, those that were shot were more active, as you would expect. But there was a broad overlap. So we took out the most active from those that were shot, and we took out the least active of those that were not shot, and we were left with a group of animals that simply walked around the enclosure. They, they both, all, all the animals we used this in, in this analysis merely walked around the enclosure, so they were matched by behavior. But what you can see is those that were shot had a, a much higher lactate level uh, than those uh, that were not shot. So the conclusion here is, is that the change in physiology <coughs> is not due to the behavior. It is due to being shocked. So it has a, a marked effect. To turn away from crustacea momentarily, I want to look at a, a delightful experiment by uh, Crook and co-workers on, on the squid. Uh, what she did was to injure uh, some squid and then place them in a tank that contained uh, a predatory fish and looked at the uh, behavior of the fish and the squid to see how they got. There were four treatments. Some squids were uninjured, some squids were injured, some of the uninjured squid also had an analgesic applied, and some of the injured squid also had an analgesic applied. So we could look at the effects of injury and the effects of analgesia separately and in combination. The first thing to note here is this is uh, the behavior of the fish. And these are the ones that were injured and these are the uninjured. And this is the distance at which the fish started uh, to, to, to observe the squid and, and, and initiate predation. And you can see it is picking on the injured squid. The fish are detecting the injury. 
uh, they initiate pursuit at a greater distance for the injured squid as opposed to the uninjured squid. Looking at what the squid are doing, the injured squid are beginning to, to take flight from the, the, the fish at a greater distance uh, compared to the uninjured squid. But here, the analgesia is, is making these fish behave just like these uninjured fish. Squid. Uninjured. And if we look at what's happening in, in the probability of capture, it is the injured squid that has the analgesia are more likely to be captured. So what they did was to really uh, look at the, the survival of these squid. Uh, uninjured squid, irrespective of analgesia, survived quite well in these uh, interactions. Uh, the injured squid didn't do as well as the uninjured squid. But the ones that did really badly were the injured with the analgesia. And they've had no input. If, if, if indeed these animals feel pain, they, they would not have felt pain. And uh, as pain is supposed to increase fitness, uh, possibly by increasing anxiety or awareness, uh, this, I, I find this a very compelling uh, study. Uh, which I've been on it. So what does this tell us about pain? I like to use this photo to describe how it's rather difficult to assess pain, even in humans. Uh, you can't be absolutely sure what's going on. This, this is <laughs> Vinnie Jones and Paul Gascoigne in a, in a famous match uh, this, this was termed an off, an off the ball incident, which I'm not sure of the right term. <laughs> uh, and, and Gascoigne is showing some facial expressions uh, which might be taken as, as, as experiencing pain, but footballers are very good at that. Um, but what he's really doing is, is looking at the referee. Uh, and so I, I don't know what Gascoigne is feeling here at all. Is, is he in pain? Is he, is he failing? I don't know. But what can we say about crustaceans of the cattle spots? I think the data that have been brought out go well beyond a simple nociceptive reflex. Uh, we, we see very long-term motivational change uh, after noxious stimuli. We see behavioural and physiological changes that are entirely consistent with the idea of pain. But while they're consistent with pain, they do not prove pain. Um, we can see, certainly, there's an awareness of the site of injury. There are indications of anxiety, increased attention to danger. Um, but none of that really uh, proves pain because it's impossible to prove pain in, in any animal. There's always an alternative explanation. The data certainly are, are therefore consistent with the idea that animals are sentient. sentient. Uh, or at least has the appearance of being sentient. And I, I don't know why there should be ev evolution of sentient-like behaviour if they're not sentient. But again, that's not proof of them being sentient. Um, but nevertheless, we see this sort of sentient like behaviour and pain like behaviour uh, in mollusks, in arthropods, within the chordates, and the split between those groups happened uh, around about 500 million years ago. It's more parsimonious to suggest that there was a single evolution of these abilities uh, that predates the split. It's a less parsimonious, but I suppose possible uh, situation. Uh, look, these behaviours have evolved independently in these three groups, or these, these abilities. I don't know uh, which uh, that could be. Um, and I successfully got through this talk without mentioning 
consciousness, and, and <laughs> I, I, I leave it at that. Thank you.